Do you have the knowledge to work with the next generation of refrigerants? ESCO Institute can help you learn the information you need with a low GWP A2L refrigerant safety course. Did you know newer refrigerants are less harmful to the environment? Did you know there are new standards for the transportation of low GWP refrigerants? Did you know most A2L equipment will require refrigerant detection systems and you will be required to use no spark, no arc tools and equipment? Get the facts. These are just some of the things you need to know to work on new equipment. Take the online course to learn more. The ESCO Institute Low GWP A2L Refrigerant Safety Course is interactive and engaging and will prepare you for the Low GWP A2L Refrigerant Safety Certification Exam. You will find the Low GWP A2L Refrigerant Safety Course on the HVACR Learning Network, the industry's leading source of online and digital content. Visit hvacr.elearn.network today. All right, everyone. Thank you once again for joining Did You Know, the ESCO HVAC show. Now, we continue to bring top educators every week to talk about things that are changing in the industry, but we also continue to grow internally. We brought on Daniel Mendoza a few months ago. Everyone's gonna see Daniel hanging out with us at the AHR Expo. And we also are adding on some additional social media moguls out here in the world of HVAC to be able to extend all of the communication, all the education that we are all experiencing in this crazy time in the HVAC industry. So who's our special guest? Any thoughts? Who's the newest member of the ESCO team? Hi, Brandman. Welcome to the ESCO Did You Know Show. How are you, my friend? I am doing fantastic. Top of the world. And welcome to the team. You know, we thank have, you very much. Uh, we are so honored. You know, as this industry continues to grow and develop, there are so many opportunities for us to come together and make this community, make this village of HVAC and building science professionals continue to grow and develop with all of these changes in technologies and in refrigerants. So, man, we're going to have a lot of fun, right? <laughs> we absolutely are. It's going to be awesome. Ty's going to be joining us at AHR as well. He's going to be down at the symposium with Daniel and Eugene. We're just, we got the hour conference coming up after that. It's just going to be a lot of wonderful education. Jay, thanks for joining us. Everyone, let us know where you're joining from. Remember, we are all here together to learn about these changes, and it's important that we build this community and we keep on getting closer. I'm joining in from just outside of Indianapolis, Indiana in Brownsburg. Ty, where are you at today? Carlsbad, Texas. How's the weather? Uh, it, it's great. It's a beautiful day outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's getting kind of miserable here. We're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about fun things in life. All right. So, Ty, you are a man of knowledge just like myself. And when we talk about technology and we talk about changes in the industry, sometimes we have to be way ahead of the game to understand what's coming towards us. And the conversation of mitigation is one in particular that a lot of people don't want to talk about yet. And we should because there's a lot of information. Ty, I would suspect that you have spent a majority of your career reading manuals. Yes. And I don't enjoy reading, but that's where the information's at. People say, oh man, you know so much stuff. And I, I really don't. I can just take the manual and I can read it and then translate that to somebody where they don't have to read it. So there's a massive information in that, in that manual alone. That's exactly it. And so I'm the same way. I, I'm not a big book reader. Uh, I will read if I have something that I can interact with and a challenge to it. And so installation and service manuals have always been that for me. I can understand how something works and I can figure things out that may not be as clear in the words, right? So let's talk about mitigation and what it is because a lot of people are concerned about mitigation going into new equipment. So let's look at just the, the definition of it real quick, Ty. The definition of mitigation is reducing the risk of loss from the occurrence of any undesirable event. Okay. So well, now, important. Yeah, now we got something we can work with. That sounds like a lot of things that we environ. We, we actually work in a, a relatively hazardous and dangerous environment regularly. So we just need to understand 
the things around us. So I would like for us to, I always like to use analogies. I'm really good at teaching people something if I can take something they already know and show them something new that's similar to what they know, right? I see you doing this all the time in your training. Okay, so let's talk about mitigation. We actually see mitigation very regularly if you work on gas furnaces and you may not understand it, may not have even seen it or recognized it, but we're gonna talk about that today. So let's take a look real quick at a gas furnace, okay? And bear with me, let's, let's paint this picture for a minute. If we talk about a gas appliance, we're talking about something that uses an A3 highly flammable gas and we intentionally ignite it. That's exactly right. All right, so what happens if it doesn't ignite properly? Our newer furnaces have a lot of safety controls that are there to help keep us from being in an undesirable situation. So, exactly. go ahead, Ty. So yeah, that's exactly right. So if we have a uh, furnace in our ignition process and it doesn't light, it didn't just mm -hmm. simply just spray gas out. Mm -hmm. We first off have a uh, control of safety that says, hey, there's not a flame where it should be. The flame sensor says there's not a flame. And the first thing is the control board says, hey, let's shut the gas valve off. Okay. We're gonna watch that, right? We bring out my little handy dandy test board and all of, all of our educators, we highly encourage you to, to build trainers, buy trainers. And if you're on a tight budget and you need to put something together that works very, very well, run to your local distributor and say, hey, I need one of your damaged air conditioning pads and I need a damaged gas furnace and I'm gonna put it to use, right? That's all I do with these. So let's take a look at a gas furnace and we're going to add flame onto the flame rectification at the beginning of the circuit. So we're going to mimic a situation where we would have a failed ignition or an improper ignition. And we're gonna see what the board does because it's actually gonna go into mitigation and we're gonna see what that looks like. So Ty, walk us through a sequence of operation on a gas furnace. Thermostat calls for heat, connects R and W. The that. control board does a safety check, make sure all the safety is good. It powers up the inducer fan motor to pre-purge the heat exchanger. Uh, we prove that through a pressure switch. Then we call uh, for a hot service igniter or a spark igniter. And then we open the gas valve, allow gas to flow through the manifold, buds, or suspicious of primary air across the burners, across the igniter, allowing to flame the burn inside the heat exchanger. The flame sensor only has a few seconds to prove a flame through flame rectification. If there's not a flame, it's going to shut the gas off. If there is a flame, we're going to keep the gas on, let the heat exchanger heat up, and then we're going to turn the blower on and start moving that beautiful heat into the house. I think you've done this a couple times. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so what but what happened with ours? We've actually got an error code now and we went into mitigation because we did not go through the proper sequence of operation. So our furnace recognized a incomplete ignition. We actually recognized flame in the circuit with the flame, uh, the flame rod, flame sensor. But then we actually went into a mitigation because the furnace thought, well, maybe there's gases there. Let's do something about these gases and let's get them out of here. So what did we do? We turn that fan on. Let's uh, let's reduce the concentration. Let's move some air. Okay. Well, we just actually completed a, a mitigation safety on an appliance. Just by so, turning the fan on. Just by turning a fan on. So when we start talking about mitigation in our new residential light commercial equipment, that's exactly what we're talking about. Now, how do we do that? And why are we doing that? Well, that's what we're going to spend time on today. So I wanna walk us through being prepared for this, and then we're actually gonna show you some wiring diagrams for equipment that will be coming out this year from different manufacturers. And we'll show you what they're doing with their equipment for mitigation, All right? So we're gonna spend a little bit of time today talking about mitigation, especially as it applies to our low GWP safety training. Now remember, the EPA has not set out its final determination on what their training or potentially required training is going to be for the safe handling of A2L refrigerants for equipment, remember, mildly flammable, but there's going to probably be a requirement. And we already have distributors that are starting to expect their contractors to go through A2L training before they buy the new equipment, just so they are aware of the safety differences. And so that's what we do at ESCO. We build material to prepare an industry, and then we talk about these things so that you know what's coming. Well, in our chat right now, we have uh, Michael is in, in the chat, and he's already had customers requesting uh, some of the new refrigerants coming out, the A2L refrigerants. And he's like, hey, what what's going to be different about that equipment? And this is, I'm so glad that you're here, Mike, because today is going to answer a lot of those questions. That's exactly right. And remember, let us know where you're joining us from. We want to know where everybody's at out here in our chat. 
So let's let's make sure that we're prepared for it. Let's talk about these A2L and these 2L refrigerants, right? So from the outside, most residential and light commercial uh, 2L systems are gonna look not a lot different. There's gonna be a few things, but there's not a lot. And we are absolutely gonna see some labeling changes and I'll show you what those labels look like here in a little bit. Now, what we have to be careful is, is understanding why we're doing this because there is a change in flammability. If you've watched any of our previous flammability videos, you understand that there's no such thing as either it ignites or it doesn't, right? It's, it's a huge uh, window of in between of how much ignition do I have? How much fuel do I have? How much air do I have, right? A lot of things that we have to put into play when we're talking about the flammability of something. But we also have byproducts of combustion. We have byproducts of combustion of fuels. Well, we also have them of refrigerants. So we need to understand what can happen with these refrigerants. So let's take a look at the, the decom decomposition of refrigerants, right? If I burn a fluorocarbon refrigerant, even the ones that we're comfortable with, the ones that have these A1 or non-flammable ratings, like 22, 134A, 410, they actually, they go through a stage of decomposition when they're introduced into flame and we have hazardous byproducts. Not a lot of people understand exactly what those products. Anybody ever smelled some byproducts of refrigerant and flame? Yeah, it's not pleasant. Whew. I've had some pretty nasty inhalation issues in my life with that, but that's part of being out in the field, especially if we're not completely prepared and trained for that. So that's what we're here to do, just to prepare and to train. So the, the, the primary areas of concern for flammability are the ignition, right? the potential for refrigerant ignition during service while we're working on things, installation, and the structures that we're working with. And so we're going to put into play some types of mitigation into our equipment to just be around in case there's ever any potential for refrigerant that's released into the area in large enough concentrations that it could be flammable. So when we talk about some of these byproducts, one of them we're gonna talk about is hydrogen fluoride, right? Hydrogen fluoride can form when any fluorine containing refrigerant, that's pretty much everything out there that we see besides our hydrocarbons, right? When it goes a, a complete or an incomplete combustion, it is one of the byproducts. That's one of the acids that we see from that. And the human nose can detect the presence of these acids, which anyone's ever been in that scenario, you know what it smells like. It's pretty good, it's pretty pungent, pretty acidic, right? Well, that's one of the byproducts that we get from our fluorinated gases. So when fluorinated refrigerants decompose, they can also form a short-lived gas called carbonyl fluoride, right? So it produces, it's, it's done during the combustion. It's a reaction from moisture that's present in the air. So then we add, you know, we got hydrogen, we have oxygen, we have fluorine, we have our ignition, we have decomposition, and we produce a carbonyl fluoride. Now, when we start talking about how much heat did it take to do that, there's this term that you're going to start hearing more of called the heat of combustion. You might have seen this in a fuel combustion class, right? It's one of yep. the components that we have to have. So heat of combustion is a measurement of the amount of heat released when a substance burns, okay? So different chemicals, different fuels produce different amounts of heat. We always talk about that in natural gas and LP often, but we don't talk about on the other burnable things. Everything's flammable at some point. Right? <laughs> Even diamonds can burn. Absolutely. And how much heat can something put off? Well, that's going to be our heat of combustion. Now, these newer 2L refrigerants have a much lower heat of combustion things like than things like our A3s, right? Our highly flammable things like uh, propane, isobutane. So, we do not have, and I keep hearing this over from top educators in the industry, and I'm gonna repeat this until the day I die, until everyone understands. Currently, there are no A3 components in any of these refrigerants that we're seeing in residential and light commercial applications, right? We're gonna see R32 and 454B as the primary refrigerants. It has no propane, no isobutane. They're not in an A3 classification, they're an A2L. So the heat from these is much less um, of that heat of combustion than what it is with an A3 refrigerant. Now, we also need something else in there, don't we, Ty? Even if we got fuel and we got oxygen. Got to have heat or an ignition source. Of some kind. Now, what kind of ignition? Because you can have an A3 that doesn't take a lot of ignition. A small spark can ignite it. Well, when we get into these A2Ls, it's actually going to take a lot more minimum ignition energy. 
So that is the minimum amount of energy that's going to take to combust or ignite these gases. So we did a video, I did a video here a while back where I used a variety of different things. I used a direct spark ignition module. I used a, um, a couple hot surface igniters, a silicon carbide, silicon nitride. I used an open flame and I went through A1, A2, A2L, and A3 gases so that we can see that each of them had different potential ignitions. Some of them would ignite with one, but not on the other. So as a reference point, let's think about this. Um, anyone ever worked on a vehicle and seen the ignition that comes off from a spark plug? Oh yeah. All right. Pretty good amount of energy. All right. So that's typically going to be in that 20 to 30 millijoule of, of ignition energy. Now it's going to take a lot of energy to ignite these A2L refrigerants. And so even if we have a release of refrigerant, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be ignition. It's going to take a lot of ignition on these refrigerants, right? So most of these new A2Ls are very difficult to ignite due to that high minimum ignition energy. So we think about some of our common items like cordless drills, toasters, hair dryers. In lab studies, they will not ignite A2L refrigerants, okay? And yeah, Ray Ray, you know, it's all a rumor that they ex that there's explosions. There's not. You know, I get people out there going, oh, I've seen these mini splits that'll explode. And, and I can tell you, you can go to places in this world and you can find A3 mini splits. You will not find them in the United States. So people in other parts of the world that have done very, very stupid things have been able to ignite highly combustible gases. We're not gonna see that here in the United States, right? We're, we're having a difficult time getting A2L certified through an entire country, let alone A3s. So <laughs> we're, not, <laughs> we're not gonna see A3s in, in these applications for a long time. Now, it takes a lot of concentration of these also. So it's gonna take a pretty significant amount of fuel before it comes combustible. Now, when we look at a comparison of different burning velocities of fuels, let's take, for instance, things that we know right now. And, you know, I will say that you probably know R32, right? You may not, but you should because it's half of R410A. R410A has got two refrigerants, R32 and R125 in it. So we're going to see refrigerants like R32, 454 coming into residential like commercial. 1234YF is what's blended with 32 to get 454B. Our vehicles, if they've not already went to 1234YF, they are all going to be transferring over to 1234YF in the, in the next few years. And so those all fall down into this lower burning velocity class. They are nothing like R600A and R290. That is our isobutane and our propane. Way up there, burns very quickly, right? I ignite it and whoop, it goes fast. Anybody ever lit gasoline? Oh, it's, it's not. quick. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully you've never been a kid and put gasoline into a baby jar and lit it and kicked it to see what it does. Because I'm telling you, the stuff moves really quick and moves faster than you can. <laughs> so it's got a very high burning velocity to it. We're not going to have that with our A2Ls or R32 and 454B, but it does leave some potential out there. So what are we going to do about it? Well, we are going to educate and we're going to understand how much it takes because we've talked about the energy. It's gonna take a certain amount of energy, right? We also know it's gonna take, if it does ignite, it's gonna burn very slowly, but how much is it gonna take? So we also have these factors that we look at called refrigerant concentration limits. And if you've never heard this before, you're going to now. You're actually gonna see it in installation manuals. I've got a chart that we're gonna show you here in just a little bit, right? That is used to determine the maximum concentration of refrigerant allowed in an occupied space. So how much of this can I put into a space before it deprives oxygen enough to point where it's unsafe. It's pretty much what we're talking about. All chemicals have a concentration limit. Like I could take gasoline. If I took that little baby mason jar of gasoline <laughs> and I put it in a garage and it all evaporated out, that's a high concentration. If I put that same baby jar in the middle of a football stadium and release it, I may not even have enough concentration for it to even ignite. Even if it was gasoline, an A3 highly flammable. So we have to be aware of what that looks like in these refrigerants. And then you also have that lower flammability, right? If I don't have enough in here, it's not going to ignite. If I have too much, it's not going to ignite. I get too much, that just means I've got more fuel than oxygen. If it's in my lower, if it's below my lower flammability, I've got more oxygen than I have fuel. So even if I have ignition on either one of them, if it's below my lower flammability limit, I'm not going to ignite. If it's above my higher flammability limit, I'm not going to ignite. Might asphyxiate, 
and I'm not going to ignite. So ASHRAE uses all of these terminologies to set the standards for what we're going to see in equipment, how much refrigerant is allowed, what areas are we going to allow that to be in. And so as technicians and educators, we're going to spend time learning more about this, right? And we're going to understand if it is going to require mitigation. That's it. So, all right, let's talk about some mitigation strategies. So the whole purpose, remember, what was the purpose, Ty, of adding mitigation onto a gas furnace? Simply move air. That's it, right? We're going to prevent the accumulation of ignitable gases. And so we, we work with A3 refrigerants all the time. Every gas furnace is burning at A3 refrigerant. I have a friend of mine, which I do not recommend, but he looks for leaks on a, on a gas pipe with a lighter. With a lighter, he's looking for a leak. And I'm, I, I do not recommend that. There's a lot of people that do that. Yeah, and yet my same time. friend is all concerned about a uh, a two refrigerants being flammable. And I was like, you literally use a lighter and you make fun of me when I say <laughs> don't use a lighter. He's like, oh, it's fine. But you're worried about A3 or A2 refrigerants that will not light, which is simply yeah. they will not hold a flame. So when you put it into perspective, hey, we work with these refrigerants, a nonstop flow of refrigerant coming to our gas furnace. And we have mitigation that allows it to, hey, we can just move the fan. We clear the air out. So if we just simply do an overabundance of caution with an A2L, just in case, it just simply is just, you know, increases the safety factor. That's exactly right. Now, so let's talk about mitigation. And we need to understand that there's not a one size fits all solution, right? I could have a big furnace in a small area. I could have a small furnace in a small area. I could have a small furnace in a big area. It goes the same way for our outdoor units, our systems that have the refrigeration. I could, depends on what part of the country, I could have a, uh, you know, a five ton system on a 1200 square foot home. I could go to the other side of the country and I could have a one and a half ton system on a 1200 square foot home. So there's a lot of variables in there. And it really comes down to, I need to be below that lower flammability limit at all times. And so we're going to introduce some means of mitigation in this. So what are the requirements? Well, mitigation strategies can include a variety of things, depending on whether it's in a residential application, a commercial and industrial application, depends on the amount of refrigerant in the system. It pin, depends on if there's ventilation in that space, depends on the type of air that we're moving, right? In some of our really large systems, we're actually gonna see things like pump down solenoids. If you've ever worked on refrigeration, you understand that a pump down solenoid is simply something we can install that can shut off the flow of refrigerant so that we can move the rest of it out. We can let our vapor pump do some work for us. So, I mean, think about this, Ty. If I had a system that had an electronic expansion valve at the outdoor unit, what, what could I do to get as much of that refrigerant as possible out of the indoor space? Oh, you could just close that uh, close that down, just like it would with a solenoid. Close it down, does an automatic pump down, just like in refrigeration, and uh, and now you don't have any refrigerant sitting in evaporator coil at all. And a side benefit, you don't have to worry about refrigerant migration to the compressor during the off cycle. So we're going to see our technology being used in a variety of new applications. I have this question all the time from guys. Hey, what about a VRV system? What am I going to do about a VRV? What am I going to do about these systems? Like, well, depends on how it's already designed. If it's already designed with an electronic expansion valve at the outdoor unit, it is now a potential isolation valve. Nothing has to be added. It's already there, right? So what happens when we get into residential equipment? I mean, that's why most people are here today, right? To understand what's residential going to look like. Well, let's just understand what we're going to see, and then I'll show you some examples that it's already in the equipment that's being manufactured. So the whole point is to use active sensors, that could alarm if needed be, or just activate a ventilation system. It could activate a solenoid. It could de-energize the components, just shut some things down. And then it'll use logic to decide how long it's gonna run. Now, when we look at these components, these have actually been around for decades, right? We've used refrigerant leak detection for decades. When I did grocery refrigeration, all of my rack rooms had refrigerant leak detection in them already. Right? Absolutely I just simply, right. Yeah, I mean, it was just for measuring refrigerant. So it's not like we're adding a complete new complexity to the industry. 
we're just bringing some new technologies into sectors that may not have already experienced these. So in our commercial refrigeration applications, we were looking for any refrigerant. If we had a leak in a space, we need to go figure out what was going on. I actually had one instance where I had a witness to uh, kind of it was a horrible situation, but it happened. I had a uh, had a head gasket on a compressor blow at a gas at a uh, grocery store, and when it did, it it dumped about fourteen hundred pounds of R twenty two in a very confined space, which was designed for situations like that. The refrigerant leak detection sensor went off. It turned on the exhaust fans on the roof. It opened the louvers on the sidewall and 1,400 pounds of R22 just went poof, so that there was no potential for having a depletion of oxygen in that space, all right? That's technology we've used for a long time. Just hadn't seen it in residential before, okay? Now we probably are. So, Ty, let's think about this for a second. If I'm a manufacturer and I'm going to try to reduce the potential for combustion of some A2L refrigerants, let's think about some ways that I can do that to the outdoor unit without adding anything significant. What can you think of that could cause some potential ignition sources on an outdoor unit? Well, anything that's going to have a spark, such a, um, like we've used open switches before that arc every time they close. So we could either use some kind of a solid solenoid or a solid type um a control now that closes at the off cycle of the sine wave, which some mm -hmm. manufacturers have, or we could simply just put a cover over the switch. And uh seems like we've already been doing that. I think we have. We've seen enclosed contactors for a very long time. So not a lot of manufacturers have been using them on the residential equipment. And they look at it and they go, well, here's an easy way we can reduce the potential for sparks off from our contacts. Let's just cover them. So we're going to see if your system has a contactor, it's just gonna be now an enclosed contactor. And let's think about some other high energy ignition points. Um, anyone ever seen terminals blow off from a compressor before or a compressor that's had blown off terminals? More than I, I would like to. <laughs> yeah, so if we think about those points, how can we reduce that potential ignition? Well, we actually did a couple decades ago. <laughs> we tried to anyhow. We started enclosing the plugs that are on our compressors. So many of the things that we're gonna see, we're already introduced to them. They just haven't been accept, accepted normal practices. So we're gonna see compressor terminals that are more concealed. We're going to see contactors that are more concealed. We're going to see motors and compressors that have less potential for ignition. We're gonna see a lot more ECM motors. I mean, that's just, we're doing that anyhow just because of energy efficiency. Now we have an, excuse, an, an additional opportunity, not an excuse, an opportunity to start moving into components that have less ignition sources to and them. Just out of an abundance of caution, just that extra step to make sure that just in the slightest thing, anything happens, they're covered. The yeah. unlikely event. The unlikely event. I mean, this is all safety. This is not for normal operation. This is in the event of a catastrophic failure of a system or component, right? I know there's a lot of questions out there and we want you to bring the questions in, right? Go ahead and in the chat, give us some things, you know, that remember now, I will warn that this is no room for negativity. This is all about positive growth. So if you're concerned about something, let's think about it from a positive nature and think about ways that we can best prepare. So bring us some questions and we'll see what we can do. Now, let's take a look at some manufacturers. And this is a major manufacturer in the industries. So if you sell one particular brand, this is what you're going to see in your equipment. Now, the things that we're seeing are there's the there's a potential to be difference between a communicating system and non-communicating system, but they're all going to function very similarly. So let's look at this one manufacturer. So what we're going to do is we're going to introduce mitigation into this is a gas furnace right here. So previously, I would have landed all of my non-communicating thermostat connections at the gas furnace board, right? Well, I need to be able to control what, Ty? Sensor and the blower. And that's pretty much it. I need to get power over to my sensor because it's running on five volt DC, like so many of our other communicating components do. And I need my power to just run the board. Now I am showing two different sensors on here only because those are two different designs of sensors that are gonna be very common in equipment, but they're only using one. One sensor mounted onto the face plate of the coil on the inspection cover that we typically see in the center of a coil or close to the center of the coil. If it's a slab, it's going to be a different location, but we're going to be able to be in the evaporator compartment. So we're going to use one of those two sensors 
connected to a mitigation board, a refrigerant detection sensing board. So you will see these RDS components in the future. And that just means refrigerant detection sensor. Now, what we're gonna do is in the event that I have a failure of a system or a component, and I have a high concentration of refrigerant. And remember, it's not just a, if it detects any, it's got to hit a certain specification. That's the reason these are five volt DC continuously monitoring sensors. Once it gets to a certain concentration level, it's gonna go, we got a problem, Houston. What should we do about it? And Ty, what are we gonna do? Let's move some air. <laughs> That's it. I know, I dra we dragged everyone out here just to tell <laughs> them that these, these new systems are just gonna look for refrigerant and if they detect it, they're gonna shut it down and move some air. But that's really what it is. And so as technicians and as educators, we just wanna be well prepared for what this looks like. So right there is a major brand that is gonna be using this particular non-communicating setup. You're gonna get a board and you're gonna get a sensor. Here is another major manufacturer using a slightly different variation on their non-communicating systems. They are sending a separate board and sensor. The board can be mounted in the furnace. It can be mounted on the outside of the furnace. It can be mounted wherever it is convenient to access. And it is just a board with a sensor, right? So this is gonna come as a kit. Because if we think about the coil, the coil is not gonna be rated in or any differently for 32 or 410A or 454B. I mean, they're all operating on a very similar pressure. We might possibly have a change of components if there's a potential place for leaks that a manufacturer recognizes, but there's not any that I've seen, right? So we could use the same design of coil, and if it is gonna be used on an A2L refrigerant, I just need to add a sensor to that, right? Makes sense, I've had this question come in before. We will be able to put ex new systems on existing gas furnaces. I'm waiting to see that specification from the manufacturer, but in my mind, I'm adding a control to a refrigeration system. My gas furnace just happens to be an additional component in there that I'm trying to protect my refrigerant from being exposed to. So I'll leave that at that. We'll, we'll see what the equipment looks like and what the manufacturers are recommending once it hits the market, which will be this year's. Most of them are saying by fourth quarter, we'll see this equipment. And again, just to put it into perspective, we have this sensor monitoring if we have an A2L, a mildly flammable refrigerant leak, mm -hmm. that it's going to move air. Yep. If you notice, we also have, what if we have a natural gas leak? I mean, these, yeah. these are things that happen that are much, that's an A3. Mm -hmm. And we don't have any kind of sensors on A3. And it's interesting that we haven't required this same kind of sensor technology just in the vicinity <laughs> of the gas furnace itself. If we have a propane leak or a natural gas leak, you know, that we don't uh, have some kind of our safeties. And that to me is way bigger an issue. So again, abundance of caution. Absolutely. I, I myself, once I seen this equipment, I thought, well, why, why don't we use that on gas furnaces to begin with? Why don't they all come equipped with a capability, just have a sensor plugged into it, right? Oh, is, could it be that simple? Yeah, it can be that simple. So when we start talking about manufacturers that have boards that are communicating capable, if you don't know, a lot of the a lot of the higher end, like if we get above two stage, a lot of that equipment is already set up for it to be communicating or non-communicating, depending on what the system design is. So the boards have already been established with a five volt DC communicating platform internally. So on some of our manufacturers, all we're doing is adding an extra plug so that we can plug the same sensor into. I don't need a separate board. I simply just need to put the plug on the furnace board so that I can control my system with just an input. If I think about this, if what if this was a, a an inverter heat pump? It's using five volt DC pressure transducers all day long. Five volt DC thermistors. It's a common platform. I don't even want to get on the tangent about why aren't we using a common common communicating platform for every manufacturer. Uh. That, that's a whole nother, that's, that's another topic. We'll get them back on that one some other day. <laughs> but if we think about how simple it is to add that onto a board if it already has the capabilities. And so this is actually an installation manual for a piece of equipment that's not out in the industry yet. So Ty, we talked about this before the show. How do we learn about equipment? We RTF read, read yeah. the fantastic manual. Absolutely. If this is an old furnace and an old system, how do I learn to work on it? 
I read the manual, read right? The fantastic manual. So Absolutely. much information is in that manual right there. It's right there. How do I learn about a new system that's not even hit the market yet? I read the manual. <laughs> so we're actually looking at a page out of a manual and it's telling us exactly what this system is going to do. What happens if my leak detection sensor recognizes? Well, here is exactly what happens. If the refrigerant detection sensor on the indoor evaporator coil detects a specified concentration of refrigerant, the furnace will enter into its mitigation mode to dilute the refrigerant, just like we did with our A3 gas. Now, in mitigation mode, the furnace will do the following things. It'll let you know something happened. It's gonna throw an error code. Anybody see the blinky lights on the... Remember, this is just a plain Jane, 80% single stage Goodman furnace. <laughs> Nothing fancy. It's got blinky lights that tells me when something goes wrong. Right? <laughs> so it's gonna throw an error code that we've got a problem. It's going to shut down the gas operation. Well, we're talking about refrigerant operation. A gas furnace, we're talking about gas operation. Same way, we're gonna shut off the gas valve. Well, we're just gonna shut off the refrigeration system and we're gonna energize an optional ventilation and alarm outputs. Optional. If you want an alarm, if you want outputs to control a separate ventilation system because your space wasn't large enough to meet the requirements and I had to add an additional ventilation system, no big deal. We're just gonna add some outputs. Anybody ever seen humidifier outputs on a board? IEQ outputs, right? <laughs> been around for a while. Yeah, been around a long time. So we're going to energize some switches for some additional outputs. And we're gonna run the fan at max CMF once the airflow detects its leak. And then the fan will, this particular manufacturer saying, hey, we're just gonna run it for five minutes. After five minutes, I mean, we're gonna be monitoring the whole time. After five minutes, if we get down to the lower flammability limit, again, lower concentration limit, we're gonna go back into operation and see if we're good. See if the problem's been fixed, see what happened. Because, well, you know, I've had the question, what if we have something besides our refrigerant? set off a detector. Is it going to lock the thing out and the homeowner's not going to have any control? There's your answer. Right there. Right there. Right in the manual, right in front of us. And and Cliff, what if another manufacturer has something, a different way of doing it? Or what if they change it? How would we know? Yeah. The manuals are really where we have the to manual. go. <laughs> it's always, the solution is in the manual. So I hope to spend, and I pledge to you all, to spend more time in 2024 showing the things that we talk about in the places where they come from. We'll talk about equipment changes in manuals. We'll talk about how pressure transducers work. We'll talk about inverter boards. We'll talk about thermistors. We'll talk about electronic expansion valves. And we'll use the manuals for the equipment to show you exactly where that comes from. Just like every other piece of equipment we've ever learned about before, right? All right, so let's take a look at a couple of different applications for our new system, right? Where are these sensors going to go? Well, if we look at this diagram, remember this is right out of a manual, it's telling us, oh, well, this is a system that's actually incorporated the socket on the furnace board. So if you're in an upflow position, you're just gonna route the wire down, kind of looks like a thermostat wiring for like a zone control or any other thing we've done in the field before, doesn't it? We're Close going switches. to, yeah, we're just going to neatly tuck away some, and it even tells us, I don't know if I kept that page, it just says that we're using 18 gauge wire, it doesn't specify shielded or non-shielded, so I'm using an 18 gauge control wire, and I'm going to run from my sensor, and I'm going to bring it into my furnace cabinet. I'm not going to go in through the cabinet that has the potentially combustible stuff. I'm running along the outside, and I'm bringing it into the blower compartment, I'm tying it into the board. If I'm a counterflow, I'm just doing like I normally do. I'm just... <laughs> It, it's not really changing. And we're gonna plug it into a socket on the board that says A2L sensor input or mitigation, whatever it's gonna be labeled. That's it, right? That's, that's just about as complicated as it gets. If we compare the wiring diagram, and we absolutely will spend a lot of time talking about wiring diagrams, and now they're getting a little bit you know, more components, we just need to see how they're working. So this is our new furnace, not yet hit the market, probably won't be out until fourth quarter. But by golly, the manuals are out there. Out there, The manuals are always there before the equipment. So the manual simply shows us that we have a plug for the A2L. What if it is being connected to a system that doesn't use an A2L refrigerant? Don't use the plug. That's what we got dip switches and settings for, yep. right? 
So the manufacturer just tells us, I actually encountered this this week. I encountered, I was talking to a technical service manager for a large distributor, and he said, hey, I got a question, Cliff. I had a new furnace installed by a technician, and I'm getting an alarm for an A2L sensor. I'm like, really? I said, I, he said, I don't know what to do about it. I said, let's look at the manual. And the manual tells you, in the manual, it says this furnace comes equipped with an A2L sensor. If it is utilized on a non-A2L refrigerant system, go to this selection in the menu and turn it off. That's it. So Keith, there you go. What happens if the A2L sensor is not working properly? Does the system go into mitigation? It is gonna go into mitigation because it's detecting a problem. And there we can see what it's gonna do. It's just simply gonna let us know. And so we're gonna see a lot of these sensors being relatively common. Every one that I have seen so far has been a four wire, five volt DC, right? Now the range, that will be the thing that we'll see, or the range is gonna be the, the same. Oh, by golly, I'll guarantee you, as soon as they hit the market, they're gonna be in here. We're gonna connect them and we're gonna see. We're gonna compare them so that you all know what we are encountering, right? We're, we're gonna take the big and we're gonna make it little. What about an air handler, Ty? Oh, do, are we gonna need air conditioning with air handlers? We need refrigerants with air handlers? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> right, but they don't have combustible gas, but could they potentially have something else that can ignite refrigerants? That the Absolutely, we got contactors and switches and let's, uh, if we sense refrigerant, let's see, what could we do? We could, uh, we could turn the, air, the blower on and start moving some air. Well, looky there, how are we gonna do that? We are gonna use the exact same four wire, five volt DC sensor. We're gonna add a little bitty board that has some normally open and normally closed contacts on it. And if my sensor gets to the point that it reaches a high enough concentration of refrigerant, I'm just gonna go into mitigation. That's it. I'm gonna shut down my source of potentially ignitable fuel. And I'm going to turn on a blower to dissipate it just to make sure. That's and again, we're talking about a big leak, like a line has to break and it has to dump a lot of refrigerant for it to be a high enough quantity for this to go in. So we're not talking about one of those small refrigerant leaks that you have trouble finding. We're not talking about, it has to be a large concentration so that if we have this amount, just for safety, we're going to make sure that we take all those precautions, move air, uh, reduce that, that concentration. Yeah, that is it. So the question that's came out, are we going to have the same sensors in air handlers as we do gas furnaces? Well, th this particular installation manual tells me <laughs> that I've got a four wire, five volt DC sensor that looks pretty much like the same one in the gas furnace <laughs> on a board. And, uh, oh, by the way, this is the board, right? So it could be a separate board or it could be the same board as we would see in our gas furnace. Okay, now let's talk about how much, right? Uh, one of the questions I've seen out there was, you know, we're also talking about pounds of refrigerant over length of time. Yeah, we absolutely are. So in our installation manuals, we are going to see mitigation charts that installers are going to need to adhere to. An installer is going to look at their piece of equipment and go, okay, I am installing this two ton matched system. Doesn't matter if it's a gas furnace, air handler, I'm a two ton refrigeration system. What is the maximum amount of refrigerant I can have in this thing? Well, our chart is very specific. It's telling us on the two ton system, two ton matchup. Remember, this is right out of an installation manual. A, our two ton matchup will have a maximum system charge of 160.5 ounces, so 10 pounds. That's a big system. That's a big one. That's a lot of refrigerant on a two ton heat pump. Probably never gonna see that. <laughs> but if we did, that's the maximum amount. And it's also saying, okay, when that is installed, I need to have a minimum air conditioned floor space, right? So to make sure that I never have, if all of my refrigerant released at once and I had an ignition source, how big of a space? What's the minimum? Well, 155 square feet, a 10 by 15 room, right? What's the chance of seeing that? Um, is there end of life notification requirement for the sensors? Oh, Keith, I'm looking forward to this. I, I keep hearing about that, but I don't know the specifications on that yet. I can't wait to talk about that when I get some in my hand, which I hopefully will soon. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you that here in a little bit. There's already service parts for these. The new stuff's out, not out in the service replacement parts already are. So I'm gonna show you that in a minute too. 
All right, so we need to have a minimum space of a 10 by 15 for this two ton unit. And I have to have a minimum mitigation airflow, a minimum amount of airflow of 280 CFM. Sounds pretty realistic. I don't know. I'm telling you, if you have a two ton unit and that small of a place, uh, you already have some manual J design issue conditions. Uh, you already have some big problems in the first place. You're going to have moisture issues, mold. You're going to have like th there's already an issue relevant at that point. Absolutely. And so when we look at these numbers, we go, man. Okay, these are all realistic. I just need to be on this two ton system. I need to be above a 10 by 15 room and I need to have at least 280 CFM. If I have a two ton drive and I accidentally have my mitigation fan speed on the very, very bare minimum of that two ton drive, I'm still <laughs> gonna be above my minimum 261.7 CFM. So we're just gonna see manufacturers going, all right, I, no matter what, my lowest fan speed has to be 261.7 CFM on a two-ton drive, no big deal. So most of the things that we're going to see, we actually already have. We just may not have recognized that. So that is our chart that we have to make sure we're not out of this parameter. It's pretty realistic to me. And then I've actually got tables that are telling us, now these are out of ASHRAE, so these are actually telling us what systems are going to have mitigation. There's actually a third one. So you have an M1, an M2, and an M3, depending on the type of equipment. In our residential light commercial, we're going to be in our M1 charge level. And so with our new refrigerants, we look at that and we go, okay, R32 in a residential application is not even going to see mitigation until we hit 4.1 pounds of refrigerant in the system. So if I got a system that only has 3.9 pounds, even 4.0 pounds of refrigerant, I don't even have to worry about any of the uh, the alarms, the fans, the mitigation, the scary sensors. I don't even have to worry about that. So it brings up a point. Is there equipment already out there with R32 in it, less than 4.1 pounds, that has no mitigation? I got a window unit right here that has R32, no <laughs> mitigation. I keep telling people, you need to go to Costco, you need to go to a big box shop, you need to walk down the aisle, and what you're going to find out is there's no R410 anymore. There's no R404 anymore. There's no 134A in any of these small systems. You can hop on Amazon right now. I highly disagree with it, and that's a whole other conversation, but you can hop on Amazon right now and order an R32 mini split system, and with if it's under 4.1 pounds, it's total design system with maximum line set, there is no mitigation on it. It looks no different than the R410A version from last year. And it has R32 in it. My refrigerator has isobutane in it, which is an A3, highly flammable, and there's no mitigation in that because it's such a small amount. That's exactly right. So we're going to have a lot of equipment out there that you won't even see mitigation on. Likely, your small ductless systems, we're not going to see it. Yeah, Don 454B has a minimum Ignition energy of 100, 300 millijoules, right? I'm not even going to hit it with a spark plug and do anything. So what we keep hearing about with the flammability of these are so blown out of proportion. And that's why we come here. That's why we bring the top educators in every week to talk about these things very professionally, very honestly, and go, hey, we're, we're all, at least here, we're, we're technicians. We've done some stupid things in the past. We, we might have caught some things on fire because we weren't prepared, even when we were working with A1 refrigerants, right? We, we might have done some things that weren't quite right. So what are we going to do with A2L refrigerants? We're just going to make sure that we do things quite right. That's all. So we're not going to see mitigation in everything. Residential light commercial, we're going to see it in split systems. Are we going to see it in mini splits? It depends on how big it is. And it depends on if it's a multi-port, right? It's going to depend on the, on the amount of refrigerant that is in the system. So there are going to be applications that have no mitigation whatsoever. But you have to read the installation manual to know what that limit is. So this particular chart is telling us what we're going to see from this one here. So remember I said that we already have re service replacement parts for equipment that's not even hit the industry, right? ICM... And all of you out there know ICM, they have, they are always ahead of the game. They're making sure they've got replacement parts for things that are out in the industry. They make OEM parts. They already have an A2L mitigation system, a universal replacement mitigation system that meets the OEM's specifications. 
Because, well, I mean, think about it, Ty. What do I need for mitigation on anything with an A2L refrigerant? I need you a sensor and a way to move some air. A board and a sensor. Yep. And that's it. So they have an, an A2L mitigation system already in play that is good for R32, 454B, and 454C, right? So I'm not seeing those hit the shelf yet, but I've seen a lot of articles for them. And this is actually right off their website. It gives you all of the instructions. <laughs> it's another manual for something from the manufacturer that tells us everything we need to know. It tells us about the sensor. It tells it its operating condition. It's operating temperatures between minus 40 and 80 degrees Celsius. It's got a, um, a voltage of 5 volts DC, plus or minus 10%, 10 milliamp volt. It's... I'm telling you, everyone, it's not as difficult as we're making it out to be. So it's about being prepared. It's about making sure we are well-educated and that we join the rest of the industry and the educators from the industry that are manufacturing these parts, that are manufacturing the equipment, that's building training, that's wanting you to be equipped to be able to make sure that you're safe and that you're successful. And so that's part of what we're we're here to do. Um, man, that, that's a lot of stuff, Ty. Anything it's you want to add in there? Anything else? Yeah, we I want to ask you. Yeah. All of this information you found, that was like highly secretive. You had to really, you oh, know, man. bend some arms to get this information. Listen back, man. He, he's got all the right people and his cell phone and he gets this stuff. No, this is all right off from the manufacturer's websites. This is all available information. The reason that we haven't seen it in paper form is because we just haven't seen the equipment yet, but it's all available. Now, are the manufacturers a little slow to train on this stuff? Well, we, we typically have seen in the past, it's that the manufacturers like to wait until the equipment is released so that they can do training for that. But there's resources out here for us to learn the things that we feel like we need to learn. Do I need to know this stuff before it comes out? No. Do I want to? Yes. So it's a matter of going out. Oh, the labels on the equipment. Oh, oh my goodness. Okay, so let's talk about resources just for a minute while I go grab something to share. So if we talk about this whole training, Daniel, if you want to bring up some QRs for these training resources, a lot of this comes from our ESCO Low GWP training. Now, we have a variety of things available for educators so that you can do these programs. Remember, this is all built for you in PowerPoint presentations. We have the e-learning modules. We have the book. You know, Jason sits on the Safe Refrigerant Transition Task Force to keep updated with all these things. So we make updates regularly. We just made one a couple weeks ago for some things that happened for the storage of refrigerants. So I'm going to pull up real quick. It's just going to take me a second, and I will bring up one of the labels that I have seen on equipment. Because remember... It is slightly or mildly flammable, all of our A2Ls that we're seeing so far. So we are going to have new stickers on the equipment. Now, let me get over here and find it for us all. That is yeah, Ray, I have to agree. Jason is a awesome gentleman. He's, I've, I ask him questions all the time and it, it's, we're a community of people. And Don Gillis is here. I ask, I bug Don about questions constantly. I'm always, uh, hey, what, what about this? And what about that? And one of the big things is we don't all have access to every professional out there, but there's a lot of rumors, a lot of false information out there. So one of the things is, you know, go to the source, get certified, take the course, the actual course. And that way you can, you know, have those credentials. You can uh, reference back to that. So that's what we're here to do. Everybody, I don't say that to everybody here because we're here learning. We're here wanting to know that extra information. But, you know, you're, you're going to hear I remember when um, 134A came out, like all this, oh, it's never going to work and it's the end of the world. The sky is falling, you know, and now we 134A is no big deal. We have something new. Yeah, that's exactly right. So what we're going to see, we're going to see a variety of different labels on our equipment. It is going to tell us that it is a fluorinated greenhouse gas, right? All of our all of our refrigerants have some potential for, you know, if they're an F fluorinated gas, it's got fluorine where it's going to have some potential for holding in heat, right? So we're going to actually show some specifications with the GWP on equipment, and then we're actually going to have labels. Let me show you here that I grabbed. I think I've got one here that I grabbed from my local Costco. 
that shows the mildly flammable R32 on the outside of the box as well as the equipment. So some of this is going to take education with our consumers. When we come into the house with a box that has a mildly flammable sticker on it, they're gonna to wanna to know what we're talking about, right? And so we're gonna see things like this. We're going to see a classification two, it's an A2L, but it's, there's not the two on this particular one, but it should, it's on the far right flammable gas. L is for a limited flammability. And so on the equipment itself, we're gonna see the flammable sticker and we're gonna see the A2L and what refrigerant it is. So. Yes, we are going to have stickers on the equipment. We're going to have labels showing that it is a flammable gas. And for any of you that have um, seen like the, the California uh, stickers for all of the carcinogenic components, everyone got used to it really quick. I went, okay, well, now that we know that almost everything that we encounter has got some kind of carcinogen to it. So now we're aware. Thank you. Same way with our equipment. In a very short period of time, people are going to start recognizing that all new residential light commercial equipment is going to have an A2L mildly flammable classification sticker on it. That's it. It's just the reality. I mean, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, it would take a change of an act of Congress as well as the uh, elimination of an international treaty, which you and I is not going to do that. So we're going to get used to the changes in the industry and we're going to professionally educate on what those changes are. That's all I got. And uh, Michael, when you install that first system, you know, take some pictures for me and uh, let me know. Yeah, I'm waiting. So I've actually had some conversations with some manufacturers. There's equipment that's out there. It's already being tested in many markets. So you have residential A2L split systems in a variety of markets around the country, just doing performance analysis and um, we'll see a lot of training content coming from ESCO in the very near future on, on what these equipment look like. All right. Good time for questions. we got a few minutes left. Anyone have anything that they would like to throw out? Don't know that we have the answers, but if we do, we'll absolutely share them with you. And if we don't, we will find the resources or we will absolutely look for the resources to get those answers satisfied. A lot of people out there going, oh, it was that simple. And sometimes it takes a couple minutes to come in. I know YouTube, sometimes those chats take a minute, so we'll give it just a second. So we've already had those QRs up for our A2L refrigerants. We've talked about the conferences that we're going to be at. We definitely want to see you all at the National HVACR Education Conference. Remember, this is not just for instructors. We do have a ton of instructors there, but anyone that's interested in learning about the industry, we want you there with us. All of our top manufacturers, all of our top educators, all of our refrigerant manufacturers and reclamation companies, the EPA, the Department of Energy are all going to be in one place to talk about these changes so we can sit face to face. We can get rid of those middle conversations that really distract from the truth and we can get down to the nitty gritty. Oh, that's a good question that just came in from Troy. Uh, the question was, are there limitations for cord length between the board and the sensor? So the ones that I have currently seen look like they're a factory six foot cord. Uh, that's what I seen in a manual. Uh, until I get one in my hands, I'm not 100% sure. But I also see 18 gauge wire. So, you know, if I've worked on systems that have electronic expansion valves that have a optional uh, four pin connector extensions for those. So comes with a predetermined amount of wire from the manufacturer. And then you have an additional extension that could be added to that if necessary. Would not be a bit surprised to see that Troy, but I haven't seen any of those accessory part numbers yet. All right, Ty Branneman, welcome to the crew. Hey, thank you very much. And I want to thank everybody that uh, joined in today and asking questions, interested in learning because I can teach a lot of things, but I can't teach somebody how to want to learn. So everybody here that's wanting to learn, I, I love that. It gives me energy. It gives me excitement. And Cliff, thanks for having me here today. Love it. We're all going to see a lot more of Ty and Daniel. Come uh, check us out at the AHR. We will be uh, in, uh, well, man, I just had it pulled up too. 
Look for Esco at the AHR Expo. We'll be running around. You won't miss us. I'll guarantee. You. I'm not going to tell you what you're going to see, but you won't miss us at all. We will be around. We'll uh, we'll be members of the press. We'll be shooting videos, doing interviews. We've got at least four. I'm working on a fifth podcast at the Podcast Pavilions. And we, ah, there we go. Thank you. I must be hired out there on it. In 1327, that's where we'll be hanging out. And so we'll have people in the booth and we'll have people out running around the floors. And yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. So we look forward to seeing you all there. And we'll see you again next week on Did You Know? The ESCO HVAC 